Hey kids, do you like super violent and brutal original high budget sci-fi stuff? I sure do, but it can get a little convoluted at times, so in this video I will attempt to explain everything that happens in Altered Carbon. All the characters, well most of the important ones anyway, and all the major events, and the entire universe as well. This will be a fucking long video, so if you want to skip over certain parts, go ahead. I have timestamps in the description, but if you want a good recap of the show, then stick around for the whole thing. Or, you know, don't. We don't have cortical stacks, we only get one life, right? So just do whatever makes you happy, man. This vid is for a breakdown of the show, not the books, though I will throw in a book reference here and there to better explain some of the more complicated stuff. But yeah, this will be 99% a show-based breakdown. If someone wants to chime in with some fun book facts, then please leave a comment. I think I cover just about everything, but if I have missed anything important or you have a question about something, leave a comment and I'll do my best to answer it. Okay, let's go! Let's start by describing the world of Altered Carbon and the main story. The series is set many years into the future, about 350 years, in an Earth city called Bay City, which was centuries ago known as San Francisco. At some point in time, humans found traces of alien species on Mars. The aliens didn't come from Mars, but this is where humans first found evidence of them, so the aliens were nicknamed Martians. Humans found a type of alien metal along with a bunch of astrogation charts which mapped out several habitable planets across the Milky Way galaxy. The alien civilization has long since vanished, but the technology left behind led to the creation of the cortical stacks which are basically hard drives that sit in the back of the human neck that hold one's consciousness. In other words, all your thoughts, memories, personalities, and so on, everything that makes you, you, is stored in the stack. If your body dies or your head fucking explodes or whatever, as long as the stack has not been damaged, you can put the stack into another body and continue going about your business. The original purpose of the stack was said to be for intergalactic travel and exploration. Simply download your consciousness and shoot it across the galaxy into another body. This eliminates the many years it would take traveling to other planets in person, and so that no one would be limited to one lifetime ever again. And this happened. Humans set about colonizing the worlds found on the maps left behind by the aliens. Though we see very little of them in the series, as most of the show is set in Bay City. Though in flashbacks, we do see the planet Harlan's world, where the Envoy Rebels have their camp, and but more about that in a bit. The reality is that the stacks have led to a form of bastardized immortality, but really for only those who can afford it, the super rich elite upper class, referred to in a derogatory way as Meths, short for Methuselah, taken from the Hebrew Bible. Methuselah was a man who lived longest of all time, uh, 969 years. <laughs> Cracker couldn't even make a solid K. Anyway, the lower class are referred to as grounders, as in the rich live up high in the clouds on top of super tall towers to escape the modern day filth, pollution, and pestilence, and those of lower stature live on the ground below in the mud and grot. So yeah, this is among other things a show about classism, and of course, the rich are portrayed as greedy dickheads. <laughs> rich people. So if your body dies and you can afford it, you can download into a new one. Well, you don't really download. Your stack gets surgically implanted into a new host body. If your stack is destroyed, you are gone forever. This is known as real death. There are a few ways around this, which I will discuss in a bit, but let's just say for most people, if your stack is smashed, crushed, or shot to bits, you are gone forever. But for the most part, if your body dies and you can afford it, you can just go get another one. Woo! However, this constant replacing and replacing of old bodies has led for a pretty big disregard for health and safety of the body. In other words, the human body in itself has become rather insignificant. It's treated more or less as property, as you can simply get a new one at a whim if it's damaged, broken, dead, or you just don't like it anymore. Thus, the bodies are now referred to as sleeves. Of course, you have to be wealthy enough to afford a new sleeve if you wreck the one you're in. You might only be able to afford a shitty old gross sleeve, or if you can't afford even that, then you go into storage. Indefinitely. In other words, your stack is placed on a shelf somewhere in a government facility and you essentially sleep for eternity, or until you get placed in another sleeve for whatever reason. So where do the bodies, the sleeves, come from? Some are cloned, some are synth bodies, like think androids kind of, but most come from criminals and people who have sold their sleeve for financial reasons or whatever. If you commit a crime, your stack goes into storage and your sleeve goes into stasis where it will be given to another person or whatever. When you come out of prison, you just get whatever sleeve is available to you, not necessarily, or very rarely, your original sleeve. Usually it's the poor people and criminals who are put into storage, maybe forever, and the rich run about in brand new bodies, even cloning top of the line bodies with a myriad array of enhancements, super super sexy or manly or whatever they desire. You can be a 200 year old woman in the body of a 22 year old supermodel with sensual enhancements or an elite killing machine, a soldier of fortune placed into the body of a super jacked combat enhanced superman. This is where the story of Altered Carbon takes off. 
Side note, all people who fall under the UN Protectorate get a stack at one years of age. So if you live to one, you get a sweet computer in your head. Nice. So what is the Protectorate that I speak of? The galaxy, well, the habitable planets within about 100 light years or so from Earth, fall under a singular ruling faction, the United Nations Interstellar Protectorate, known simply as the Protectorate for short. Basically, over the last 350 years, the UN replaced all governing bodies on Earth and more or less united the entire planet under a single rule, creating the Interplanetary Super Empire. They have a bunch of your usual governing bodies, police force, military, and so on, and also a very special interstellar military known as the United Nations Envoy Corps, a group of super soldiers that are trained to withstand the psychological trauma of needle casting. Okay, bear with me for a brief moment as I explain what the fucking Envoy is, as it's kind of all over the place in the show, but it's important to know before I can introduce our characters. So, we know we can put a stack into an empty person, a sleeve in storage, right? Just pop that chip right into the back of the neck and off we go. But we can also transfer the raw data itself. So instead of removing the physical stack, with the right technology you can shoot your consciousness across the world or even the galaxy and download into a new stack in a new host. This allows for extremely quick travel across the universe and is called needle casting. The downside of this is that over time, constant needle casting will drive the host mad. The psychological trauma of shooting your consciousness across the universe takes its toll and turns people insane. So the UN Protectorate designed a program to make super tough, emotionally devoid super soldiers that are trained to withstand the side effects of needle casting. The result ending in UN sanctioned killing machines that have almost no emotions or remorse, an effective and useful death squad that can be deployed instantly almost anywhere in the Protectorate. Need some nasty work done on another planet? Bam! Download the Death Squad into standby hosts and off they go. It's pretty brutal. These were known as envoys in the books. In the show though, it gets a bit confusing. The UN envoys have long since disbanded, thus making Takeshi Kovacs the last envoy. There is another group of soldiers too, the United Nations Colonial Tactical Assault Corps. These guys, they all seem to use the same armor, so yeah, the rebels, a group of anti-protectorate freedom fighters led by Kelcrest Falconer, and the disbanded UN corps are both referred to at different times as envoys. So basically an envoy is a super tough killing machine trained to withstand extreme physical and psychological abuse. A real fucking badass. Our main protagonist, Takeshi Kovacs, was formerly one of these UN badasses. But after having a change of heart, basically not wanting to kill his sister, more on that in a bit, he turned on the SeaTac and ended up fleeing into the jungles to join the rebels. All of this is learnt through flashbacks. You see, we first meet our main protag, Takeshi, when he is killed in a firefight with a cop. He is put in storage and some 200 years later, present day, he is brought out of storage and put into the body of this dead cop. But more on that in a bit. Here is a brief summary of Takeshi Kovacs' life. He and his sister Raylene were born on Harlan's world, another planet, to an abusive father and abused mother. One day after their father killed their mother, Takeshi shot his father dead. He was taken into custody by the Colonial Tactical Assault Corps, CTAC, and was given the chance to enlist. He agreed as long as his sister would be safe. They trained them young, you see. He spent the next decade or so basically being the protectorate's bitch. And on one mission, he was sleeved into his original host body. His original sleeve had been kept in storage by the Protectorate. His mission was to wipe out a Yakuza threat back on Harlan's world. On the mission, he recognized his sister, who was meant to go to a nice family somewhere, but instead was sold to the Yakuza. Betrayed by the Protectorate, and with his sister about to be shot to bits, he turned on the SeaTac Marines and shoots them all up. This is a pretty powerful moment, as they were his work buddies, his squad mates, his fellow soldiers, the people he has trained with and fought side by side with for the last decade, and Takeshi just shoots them all to shit in order to save his sister, who he hasn't seen for over a decade. Ray Lean, joining sides with a brother, turned on the Yakuza, and so both fugitives from their separate factions, they flee together into the woods and join the Separatist rebels as mentioned earlier. Fun fact, the leader of the Separatists, Kelquest Falconer, and Takeshi Kovacs become star-crossed lovers. Aww. Also, Kelquest was the one who invented the cortical stack in the first place. Ashamed of what her invention had become, basically another way for the rich to lord it over the poor, she turned into the rebel we know and started her uprising. Humans are not meant to live forever, she thinks, as immortality eventually corrupts all, she thinks. During one of the flashbacks, we see that the Protectorate attacks the rebel camp, and both Raylene and Takeshi's lover Kelquest are both exploded in a ship trying to escape. A true death. Or so Takeshi thinks. Takeshi manages to flee and turns to a life of crime where he is eventually captured. That's, that's the first scene we see. Ni gets put into storage and re-sleeved 200 years later, and this is where the main story takes place. Whew. Okay, so yeah, it's pretty complicated shit, but now that we're done with that, it's, it's mostly chill from here on. Mostly. Takeshi was taken out of storage by one of the oldest and richest men in the Protectorate, Lawrence Bancroft. 
Why? You see, someone murdered Bancroft, shot him right in the neck through his stack, giving him the real death. But here's the kicker. If you are rich enough, you can back yourself up into the cloud. Yeah, you can basically take a copy of your stack and have it stored somewhere else. So if your stack gets fucking blown out of your face, you can download it into a new stack and you are good to go again. The problem is all the memories since your last backup will be lost with the stack and so Bancroft never knew who his killer was. Basically the last 24 hours or whatever of his life were wiped from his memory. It looked like a suicide, but the arrogance of Bancroft is so strong that he believed he would never try to kill himself, and so he strongly believed somebody was out to get him. And so using his influence and wealth, he takes Takeshi out of storage and hires him as a private investigator, charged with finding his would-be killer. He also opens up a large line of credit for Takeshi. But why Takeshi? You see, envoys possess total recall and are able to discern subtle patterns within seemingly unrelated events. They possess a thorough understanding of body language and vocal tonality and blah 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 blah. Basically, they make sick detectives. Also, having the last envoy as your puppet makes for a pretty big statement. Envoys are legendary and Bancroft likes to flaunt his status. There is a little bit more to this, however, which we will talk about in a bit. But why would Takeshi say yes? Well, basically, he gets a full pardon, 50 million credits, that's a lot, keeps the badass sleeve, and so on. Basically, he gets a new future. I mean, what else is he gonna do? Go back into storage? Not bloody likely. Well, he kind of wanted to. But the real reason he takes the case, though, instead of going back into storage, is because he has a bit of a hallucination of Kelquest, his lover, who in the hallucination tells him to finish the mission. Perhaps he can put an end to the immortal rich pricks in this new world and seek vengeance for his lost love. Perhaps not. But regardless, honor compels him to take the job, so Takeshi runs around in his new future world in search of Bancroft's killer. Here we meet a variety of fun and lovable characters. Let's have a look at some of them before continuing our story. This chick, Kristen Ortega, is a high-ranking Bay City Police Department officer. She was originally tasked with solving Bancroft's murder, but ruled it as a suicide and closed the case. Bancroft, of course, didn't agree with her ruling and thus hired Takeshi. She seems to really despise the upper ruling class and ends up following Takeshi around. But why? You see, Takeshi has been re-sleeved into the body of her former partner and lover. That's right, folks. This super jacked body belongs to a disgraced police officer, Elias Riker, who was framed for a crime he didn't commit, supposedly. The killing of Leonard Kai Harris, a senior CISOP and CTAC administrator. But it's not important who he is. Why he was set up, though, is important, because Riker was working on a case, a religious coding case. He believes that people were being murdered and then recoded so they can't be spun up again to testify. Basically, the super rich people were doing something very illegal and Riker was getting too close so they bumped him off. More on religious coding in a bit. So Riker's stack goes into storage and Takeshi gets his sleeve. Krista Notega is shadowing Takeshi, making sure nothing happens to the sleeve she fell in love with, with the hope that one day she can put Riker back into it. So why are these guys after Takeshi? Because they were hired to do so. More on that in a bit. Dmitry Kadman is a Russian hitman who worked a lot for the Yakuza. Dmitry copied his stack and put it in a new sleeve. This is known as double sleeving, basically cloning yourself, and it's very illegal. Dmitry Kadman earned the nickname Dmitry the Twin and was hired to apprehend Takeshi, but his sleeve and team were killed by Poe in the AI hotel. So who hired him to get Takeshi and why? <laughs> More on that in a bit. Poe the AI, my favorite character. There is a whole other world in the universe of Altered Carbon, a whole other race even, a race of AI, who operate in the dark but are fully sentient. Little is known of this world, but maybe we will explore it further if there is a season two. Poe is the AI owner of the Hotel The Raven. Fun fact, Poe is clearly modeled after Edgar Allan Poe, the author and poet, and The Raven is arguably Poe's most famous poem. Most people don't stay in AI hotels anymore due to the obsessive nature of the AI hosts. Once signed in, the AI host will do whatever they can to satisfy by their clients, becoming rather clingy, as seen in the first scene where Poe mows down Dimmy and his gang. Takeshi is Poe's first guest in 50 years. So who's this lovable little scamp? This is Mr. Liang. Aww. The shadow man or the, the man with no sh face or something, I don't know. Mr. Liang is a brutal hitman and a true believer. He thinks the Mets, the upper class wankers, are more or less gods, immortal beings sent from above for him and others to worship. So he does their bidding. Whatever they ask, he does without question, including murdering children. No biggie. Captain Tanaka is another player in the game. Commander of the Bay City Police Force, he is pretty dirty and takes bribes from the meth and more or less does their bidding. He was a good cop once, but simply can't go against the will of the powerful elite, and so he doesn't. Deep down, you can tell he's aching, but he still takes the money and hides the evidence or whatever the meth want him to do, really. Another meth puppet is Omar Prescott, 
I don't know how to say her first name. She is a lawyer retained by the Bancroft family. She is groundborn, not upper class, but believes herself better than the rest. She is trying to gain favor with the super elite so that she too can one day become a part of the ruling class. Of course, the Mets lead her on in order to get what they want and ultimately dispose of her when they are done. After they do this, though, she uses her knowledge against the Meth towards the end of the series. We also have this little side plot going on with Vernon Elliott. He is an ex-Marine and the husband of Ava Elliott and the father of Lizzie Elliott. He was initially a suspect in the killing of Bancroft as he sent a death threat to Bancroft. Bancroft gets a ton of these death threats daily though. So it turns out he wasn't the murderer and Takeshi kinda befriends him. Kinda. His daughter Lizzie was working as a prostitute and was raped and tossed out by Bancroft and was actually impregnated by him. You see, after living for so long, Bancroft's sexual appetite grew, but more on that in a bit. Bancroft's wife, Miriam, found out about the pregnancy as Lizzie came to their home asking for support or something. Miriam wanted to avoid a scandal, so she ambushed Lizzie and kicked the shit out of her, killed her sleeve and forcibly aborted Lizzie's child with her boot. She then gets some help and sends Lizzie to a torture place where she is traumatized and then later put into storage. And this is why Vernon sent the death threat to Bancroft. Who knows if he was ever going to try to actually kill him? I mean, maybe. With the help of Takeshi and more importantly Poe, Lizzie gets special treatment in a virtual environment. She later plays a big part in the series as does Vernon's wife, Ava, who happens to be a sick hacker. Ava was in prison this whole time for hacking, but Takeshi paid for her parole and got her out. But the only sleeve available was this man. So into the man goes Ava. It's all a bit strange. There's a bunch of other characters that play a role in this show, in the present day and in the flashbacks, but this video is going to be long enough. If you have a question about someone I've glossed over, leave a comment or, you know, Google it. So, on with the story. So what actually happened to Bancroft? Well, it turns out he wasn't murdered after all. He did kill himself. You see, after living for over 300 years, Bancroft's sexual appetite grew, as I mentioned earlier. He frequented all kinds of smutty brothels and brutally bashed and raped or simulated raped a whole bunch of women. He did unspeakable things to these people. But there was a line he told himself he would never cross. He would never give someone the real death. So even when he bashes and fucks up a sleeve, he would always buy them a new one, maybe even a better one, if you can call it that. This way, he could justify his sadistic sexual brutality. Though, during one incident while beating and fucking a woman, he smashes the stack and gave the person a real death. He couldn't deal with the guilt of what he did, and so before his next back up to the cloud, he blew out his stack, thus erasing all recent memories, including the true murder of the prostitute. He knew he would back up and download into a new host, and knew that his arrogance wouldn't believe it was a suicide. And lo and behold, this is what happened. But his death is a little more complicated than that. So here's the big twist reveal thing. Takeshi's sister, Raylene, is still alive. But how? When Takeshi asks Raylene how she is still alive and how does she have the same skin, her birth skin, she says an archaeology student found her at the ship's wreckage with her stack and some genetic material. It's a one in a million chance, she says. She was re-sleeved into a synth body, pleaded innocent somehow, and ran away with her DNA. Over the years, she made a lot of money, cloned herself a new body, and so on. But here's what really happened. You see, the missing key to the whole murder puzzle was Raylene the whole time. Takeshi, after being reintroduced to his sister, finds her clones and discovers that Raylene has become one of the super elite meths. She has a variety of sleeves that she uses for whatever reason. In the case of Takeshi, she used them to spy on him appearing as this sneaky rich bitch or this little child and god knows what else. We learn that Raylene never really gave a shit about the rebellion. Remember, she grew up as an enforcer for the Yakuza, so who knows what shit she has been through, what that would do to your mind, but she ends up betraying the rebels and gives away their location. She makes a deal with the protectorate. She says they gave her life. They gave her money, backups, clones, all of it, whatever she wanted to snitch on Quell and the rebels. She then reveals that she did it all for Takeshi, her big brother. She never believed in the cause, and it appears she was rather jealous of Quell and envious of Takeshi's love for her. She also didn't want her and her brother to die for a fruitless cause. But also, even more so, over the years her soul got corrupted, just like Quell said it would. She actually blackmailed Bancroft to stop a very important political bill from being passed. Bill 653. And this is what it all comes down to. There is a law in this world that plays a very important role. There is such a thing as religious coding. This means if you are a part of a particular faith, by law, when your sleeve dies, you must be put into storage or something. Basically, your religion dictates that you are not allowed to be put into a new sleeve no matter what the circumstances are. More or less, you have one life. But Raylene runs a disturbing brothel that caters to the most disturbed of wealthy patrons, the head in the clouds. It is a sadistic place where the patrons get to completely ravage the host. Any deviancy is allowed. In this one scene, we get a bit of a glimpse. 
truly disturbing stuff. The thing is, it's not that disturbing, as it's established that the sleeves are a fleeting thing. After the event, the prostitutes will get new sleeves, right? Wrong. You see, this is the real kicker. Raylene's brothel offers a very special selective service. The patrons get to murder a host that they think is going to be resleeved, but actually won't. So after the brutal slaughter, Raylene changes their coding to religious coding, and thus they can never be spun up again. She tells them that they will be resleeved upon death, but she tricks them, recodes their stack, giving it religious coding, meaning they can never be resleeved again. She then uses this as a selling point to the ultra-rich and sexually depraved. Basically saying, if you can afford it, you get to fuck and murder a person who will never come back. In other words, you get to actually kill someone. Kind of like in that movie Hostel. Because of the religious coding, the host will never get another sleeve. But this new law, Bill 653, was going to be passed in court, saying that despite of religious coding, a stack could be spun up again to testify in court, depending on the circumstances and so on. This would ultimately lead to the ruin of Raylene's depraved business, a business that she built her fortune on. And so she hatches a plan. She blackmails Bancroft. Raylene helped Miriam recode Lizzie to religious coding that she couldn't be spun up again and testify against Miriam and help, or helped her go mad or something like that. She did Miriam a favor, but then Raylene wanted something in return. So she had Miriam drug her husband with Stallion, a super aggressive aphrodisiac which enhances your manliness, testosterone and aggression and so on. And Miriam agreed, you know, almost not really reluctantly because she felt betrayed that her husband had impregnated another woman. So she was happy to go along with this for the most part. Bancroft then visits the head in the clouds and fucks and murders a prostitute. The drug turned him into the super aggressive monster. I mean, more of one anyway. And he gave the prostitute a real death too, crushing the stack. Raylene then blackmails him to use his political influence to stop the bill. She also uses this sway to get Takeshi out of storage. So basically, everything we see, all the shit that went down was orchestrated by Raylene in her attempt to get back her brother and also to save her business. She has gone quite insane. Raylene's obsession with her brother is like super weird. It might even be sexual as depicted by this scene. No rules, but that means Ooh! Ultimately, she is a mental case and must be destroyed. Ultimate power corrupts ultimately. So this is how it all ends. Takeshi, with the help of his gang of lovable ruffians, destroy all Raylene's backups of the virus taken from the stack pox of long ago. Shit goes down and Takeshi kills his sister, blows her fucking stack right out, and with no backups, she's fucked. The real death. But before he kills her, Raylene reveals that she actually backed up Kelquest before blowing up the ship. What the fuck? Takeshi's love, the love of his life, is still out there somewhere, supposedly. So Takeshi takes off into the new world, presumably to find his lost love. But just before that, he reveals to the world or to the police, via footage taken from his hidden camera in his eye and all the other evidence that they've got, all the crazy shit that went down. The political influence, the blackmail, religious coding bill and so on. The real death of a prostitute by Bancroft and so on. Also with the help of Lizzie and the gang, he exposes Miriam's crime, the sleeve death of Lizzie and the killing of the unborn baby. Bancrofts are ruined and they both go to prison. The end. This is ultimately a story of love. A fucking brutal story, but kind of like a heartwarmingly brutal story. I have a problem with just one element of the show, the backups. Now, I am willing to accept that your consciousness can be stored on a little device. I'm also willing to accept that your consciousness can be transferred to another stack across the world, whatever. This is not a new concept in sci-fi. Digitalized consciousness? Sure, why not? But if you are backing yourself up, you are cloning yourself. So if your original stack dies, the backup is not the original you. This brings up many moral and philosophical questions. Is a clone of you really you? Well, essentially it is, but it's not you, you, you know? It has all of your memories, but it doesn't have, say, your soul or whatever. So what is this copy of you exactly? I mean, it's not you, it's a clone of you. So even if you are backed up, your legacy can live on in the new version of you or whatever, but the original you is dead and gone forever. I don't like that they don't really address this in the show. They act as if it's still the original version of you, but it's not. It's like a cloned version of you. It's kind of, kind of weird and spooky like that. Like, you're still dead. If, you, if your stack blows up, you're still dead. It's just a copy of you is taking over from where you left off, more or less. It's kind of weird. But aside from that, I totally love this show. There's a few other flaws here and there, but whatever. We finally get a show that doesn't cock tease its audience, or vagina tease, or whatever you have. I mean, it doesn't bait us for a season two. We get a solid ending, and all loose ends are tied up. Well, most of them anyway. I would love to see more of this giant and elaborate universe, but if not, I'm satisfied. The mill was epic, and I don't even need dessert. This is how you make a show. You don't treat your audience like babies. You throw them into the deep end, and you let the story just flow. This world feels 
feels lived in. It feels like all this is going on without us, the viewers, being privy to it all. So it doesn't bore us with expositional dialogue trying to explain every little thing. It doesn't need us to know who everyone is. We will figure it out as we go, and if we don't, it doesn't really matter. You don't know everything about the world we live in now, and you can still have fun with it. No one is omniscient, and you don't need to be in order to be told a great story. Well played, Altered Carbon. Well played. This show is the fucking brutal sci-fi we have been needing for a very long time. Richard K. Morgan is the author of the books on which Altered Carbon is based, and he wrote two sequels, Broken Angels and Woken Furies, both of which involve Takeshi Kovacs. So there is plenty of material for a season two. At the time of recording, Netflix has not yet commissioned a second season. I am okay if this show ends, it wrapped up nicely, but I wouldn't scoff at a season two. I think it could be awesome. What do you guys reckon? Want to see more Altered Carbon? Also, if you like the sound of my manly voice, you can check out my new podcast show, True Story Bro, where I tell of adventures from my real life experiences. New episodes every Tuesday. Thanks for watching. Yeah. Thank you.